All right, so this is Stephen Chin for Night Hacking, and I'm interviewing Chris Chedji, and we're talking about um, patterns for organizing your code base. So what, what are some of the recommendations you have on how you can keep your code bases cleaner? Yeah, well, you were just telling an interesting story about uh, doing your uh, assi assignments in college um, by just basically blatting all the code into a single main uh, class and function. Um, so that's not advisable? Yeah, well, most people get to a certain point and they decide there's actually too much uh, in one function and they get sick of, sick of trying to find stuff. So stuff that they uh, find they're regularly looking for, they'll pull it out and put it into another function, maybe in the same class. Okay, so that would have been a good sort of okay, next so step. Okay, so a step up would be getting things out of the same method. 5,000 line methods are no good. Yeah, it's everyone's to their own preference, but... Uh, 10,000 line classes. Okay, so our, our second anecdote. Yeah, so... So you know. one, of my, one of my first work experiences was I was working for a company, um, and the guys on the team were XC hackers. And so they didn't really, well, they weren't really into this, like, OO thing. Like yeah, they, they were more. <laughs> They were more into you know the old school procedural programming, and their their idea of um, good methods was when they were creating the program logic for our business transformation language we were building. They they had single methods which um, were a couple thousand lines of code long. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they they had they had a few methods, but they would. Yeah, Each yeah. of them would be about a thousand yeah. lines of code. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, you, at some point most people would think, you know, I'm having trouble understanding this, whereas if I break it into chunks, maybe that would help. Add a few go-to um, statements in there. Go-to, perfect, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the, the analogous uh, uh, of, of a go-to statement at the architectural level. I call it the architectural go-to. It's that feedback dependency that turns a nice structure back into a big cyclic tangled mess, okay? And uh, you know, go-tos, we took them out of most languages for good reasons, because they wreck yeah. your head trying to understand any kind of flow. But people put them back in their and architectures. People sneak them back into their architecture. Yeah, now, back in, back in the day, the C guys now, at least they called it go-to. We just kind of make a little call and we don't realize what we're doing most of the time. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, on a more serious note, what sort of things can can your modern um, software development teams learn about the code organization to better? Yeah. Well, I guess it's exactly the same principles that would have uh, have us, uh, as guess, as an industry, coming up with OO languages uh, rather than just continuously pro programming in C. Is to organize your methods in some way. Okay. We organize them into classes. Um, that, we do that for a reason, because we have trouble understanding too many functions uh, just without any other organization. Well, the best thing I like about classes is there's, there's only 26 letters in the alphabet. So you run out of one letter method names until you split them into separate <laughs> classes. Yeah, so you've just expanded your namespace beautifully. Yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, that wonderful. Is a, that isn't. I guess that might be one of the uh, one of the benefits uh, in mind. All right, the guys who invented C plus plus. I haven't heard it, um, but yeah, I mean, it just gives you a way to th to organize stuff uh, better. And I think the problem is that kind of was taken over uh, when we when we went to object oriented languages. We put everything into classes. Um, but we did never organize the classes into higher level structures, really. Okay? Yeah, it was kind of yeah. accidental. And that kind of works until you have a few thousand classes. Uh, 20, 30,000 classes, you need to have them organized in some way. So having um, a, a thousand classes in a single package, not recommended. And again, it's everybody's uh, has their own threshold. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd be thinking around 20 is a nice number. Uh, but. Um, yeah, it, it's exactly the same principle. It's abstraction, it's information hiding, and it just helps you uh, organize your work, right? And organize when instead of working as an individual uh, trying to find, uh, you know, the code within a method, you, now you've got many methods within the class in your homework assignment. Same principle applies when you have a team of 20 guys working on some code. They need to understand a bigger picture of some sort so they can find, not just so they can find yeah. stuff, we can all you know, grep or, 
Or? So are you, a, are you a big fan of frameworks? I mean, that seems to be the trend in the industry as you, you choose a framework, either a web development framework or a code organization framework, and it's, it's half to get some benefits of dependency injection or something, but the other half is to have a, a standard so you know where to find things. Yeah, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, I think, you know, from uh, the perspective of uh, an architecture where people understand the code and how it hangs together, uh, the, the framework does a lot of the repetitive work for you, and that's good, but it also hides a lot of the, uh, a lot of the connections um, until runtime. Yeah. And you can end up with a lot of stuff inside your spring manifest files, inside that XML, which used to be at least explicit within your, within your source code. So yeah, no, so in other words, you end up turning um, code into, well, your metadata is, has a lot more code in it than you'd think. You're coding in XML yeah, that's rather it, exactly, than coding in your programming exactly, language. Yeah. The complexity is always somewhere. It's just if you hide, either you put it somewhere in an organized way where people can find it or you sweep it under the carpet into XML files. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. We've, we've found different tricky ways to confuse ourselves. Yes, yeah, And exactly. our teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what, what's your thought about like different programming languages and the ability to work in large teams? Do you see any difference with using you know, Java versus .NET versus um, Scala or other modern languages? Or are they all about the same? Uh, um, I, I think a lot of it is around how you uh, apply something usually above the language in order to organize your code. You know, architecture uh, becomes more important as the code base grows bigger, as the team size grows bigger. And it's more a matter of, you know, you've got all this stuff with vast amounts of interdependencies. If you don't organize it in some ways that those interdependencies somehow make sense, it's not a big chaotic mess that happens accidentally, then you're going to have problems. And I think the, the programming languages kind of tempt you to get more disorganized more quickly maybe than others. But ultimately, the same basic it's, principles of organization it's the same apply basic based principles, yeah. regardless of what language has yeah. functional programming, which is you know the the current craze now in programming languages. Has that really yeah. changed this, or is it? You know, I don't know. I'm sort of uh, looking at that. I'm uh, taking a, a Haskell course myself. Oh, um, very nice. And, and loving it. <laughs> it reminds me uh, of some uh, formal method stuff I did back in the day. And it's very expressive. You can do a lot in a small amount. How does that scale? You know, is, is there going to be multi-million line Haskell code bases? And if there are, how do we organize uh, that into something that it isn't just a million lines of stuff? So. That's going yeah, to be well, interesting. I think one of the things which changes in functional languages, because we, we've been chatting about like lines of code or number of lines in a method and all this stuff, and the, the density that you're able to achieve in a, you know, with a good mm. functional mm. style of mm. programming is much higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're using like stream operations and maps and folds and you know, shorthand operators for all this, you can basically squeeze in an entire method's worth of complexity on list iteration and different concepts yeah, in a single yeah. line. Yeah, yeah, and suddenly yeah. your the granularity or the level of um, separation you need is much higher. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's absolutely right. You're getting, uh, because it's so much more expressive, your code base just shrank in a sense. Yeah, but you still and need the same uh, level of um, conceptual um, decoration on top of it to be able to understand and work with it. Yeah, and I suppose his, historically when this sort of thing happens, your, uh, your, your code base kind of shrinks, but then you're going to take on bigger logical problems. So it grows again, right? So True. it's just you're getting more done in, in a higher density. So, so um, we've been talking about how to organize your code base and um, improve it. Are there any tools or ways which you can um, do this with a large code base? Like, let's say you had an existing code base with hundreds of thousands of lines of code, which you may be taking ownership of, but not have originally caused the mess with. Yeah, I mean, you, you need a tool. The problem is with a large code base like that, the kind of structures you're, you're, you're needing to uh, understand and analyze and manipulate 
uh, ar arise out of the code. So your pure IDE tends not to really cut the biscuit from that point of view. You're going to need to uh, uh, some other tools. And there are tools. There's uh, tools like uh, Sonargraph, Latix, um, IntelliJ Ultimate. Uh, my own company, we produce a product called Structure 101. All of these tools, what they do is they um, basically scan your code and create a model, a hierarchical model that addresses all the, shows all the containment relationships and the dependency relationships, and then rolls up the dependencies, if you like, through the containment structure. And that lets you kind of find certain containment patterns, things like tangles, experiment with ways of moving classes between packages to remove your cyclic dependencies and that type of thing. Okay, so some combination of um, having a tool which lets you visualize what your code dependencies are and then refactoring to kind of restructure and move things around and organize it better. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just being able to see dependencies isn't really good enough. You're going to need something that's uh, a model that's malleable. You can go in there, try different things and uh, move stuff around and see how the, the dependencies roll up immediately through the structures when you've moved things around a certain amount. Cool. What's the what's the largest code base you've attempted to um, analyze or? Oh, up into the many millions. So uh, 10, 20 millions for sure. Nice. Uh, if Java, and Java was code. It, were you surprised at the level of complexity or? Um, yeah, the very large code bases tend to have a couple of things in common. One is they tend to have somewhere in there, which is, uh, is a very large class level tangle. So a bunch of classes that are cyclically dependent. Now you'll get in any code base, you're going to get 20, 30 classes in tangles spread out around the code base, which is okay. But you get them up into the thousands. I've seen 2,000, 4,000 classes in massive class level tangles, usually right in the core of where all the other uh, code, the other applications perhaps that depend on this core area. Um, and uh, when you say this to, your, to the customers, they often say, ah, yeah, that's where <laughs> we've got our problems, right? So that's its own kind of problem. Busting up a 4,000 class uh, tangle has its own uh, challenge there. But. Yeah, no, that sounds like it's a little bit more than an automated tool is going to do to say, oh, take this class and abstract it out. Yeah, no, it needs a lot of head scratching. You've got a systemic problem. But quite often what you'll find in the tools is you'll find sort of hubs, area, things that seem to be dependent on everything and everything depends on them. And you can experiment, well, if that wasn't there, would that, how would that break up the tangle? And it, maybe it'll smash up into three or four pieces when you do that. So you say, well, I can't delete that class because it's doing something, but how do I re-implement whatever it was doing so that it isn't this two-way dependency across the board? Got it. Cool. So um, I think this has been a good overview for folks yeah. moving all the way from you know basic OO class organization to massive code bases and how you organize them for teams. Um, and I'm sure you covered all this in the presentation that you gave here at the Ordev conference. I did, I did. And if there was a camera in the room, so at some point I guess <laughs> it's uh, going to appear on the internet. Did you get any good questions or comments in your, in your talk here? Which? Uh, yeah, interesting. I kind of ran pretty much up to the end. So I had a couple of comments, uh, but I can't remember what they were. Nothing earth shattering, I think. <laughs> <laughs> General, uh, well, well received. I think people like to see that not only is it, you know, I think it was making the case that really this is a pervasive problem. Yeah. Um, it's one that everybody has uh, to, to, to some degree. Um, but the good news is it is soluble. It is something you can do something about. And it's not that hard. You know, so, and I, I think comments afterwards, people were coming up and saying, you know, uh, what I was trying to address was specific, not just here's the tool and how it works, but what are the patterns that you're looking for in order to disentangle a code base? And what are the strategies you would go through? So that's the kind of side that I was uh, covering this time, more cool. so than in the past. And that went down well, I think. Yeah, so like you mentioned, all the Ordev talks are published online, so you can watch Chris's talk yeah. um, in the recorded format. And it was great to make some time to do this short interview for the Night Hacking live stream. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Stephen. All right. Thanks very All much, right. Chris. Cheers.